You know, I, I figured out a long time ago that uh, if God opened the door and, uh, and, and, and I knew that the Lord opened the door, that I'd just go ahead and walk through the door and not worry about what it was like once I walked through. Now, there have been some places where I was glad to leave when I left. I have been in some places where they were real glad I left when I left. <laughs> Then there's been some places that are always hard to leave, and it's just because, you know, uh, you have a common bond. And uh, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight, then there is a common bond between you and I, and it's called the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I'm thankful for that tonight. As we came in here and we sang the songs, do you realize that you're proclaiming your doctrine every time you open that hymn book and sing those old hymns, the old hymns. I mean, those hymns about the blood, you know. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. You know, that's a doctrinal statement, and that statement is there's only one way to get rid of your guilty stains, and that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And religion doesn't declare that today, but the Word of God does. And we sing those songs since Jesus came into my heart. <laughs> you know, there's been a change since Jesus came into my heart. And you know, that's a doctrinal statement. It tells you that, that Jesus comes inside you when you get saved. That's a doctrine. And every time we stand up and open that old hymn book and sing those songs, John Wesley and Charles Wesley uh, write those songs, you know, in the song we sang tonight, Amazing Love, uh, How Can It Be? Brother, I'll tell you what, there's always been a couple things that have amazed me. One of them has been the love of God. I'm amazed. I can't, I can't understand how God could love a sinner like me. I can't understand how God could love a sinner like you. <laughs> it's amazing, you know that? But I'm thankful for the amazing love of God that allowed Jesus Christ to come down to this earth and die on a cross, the just for the unjust. He took your place on the cross of Calvary and died for you. And I'm thankful for that tonight. And then the amazing grace. You know, uh, we sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> and I'm thankful for that tonight. I can't understand the grace of God. The Bible says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in that how he was rich yet for your sakes became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. And brother, you know, it just, it just goes beyond my uh, ability uh, to comprehend. I can't understand how God could love me enough to do all that, but he did. He did, and I'm thankful for that. And uh, I never tried to figure it out. I just believed it. <laughs> and believing it changed everything in my life. Uh, there are some people that sit around and they try to figure it out. You know, they've got a little mo bit more gray matter than I have, and by the time I get done here tonight, you'll realize I don't have too much gray matter, and the little bit that I did have, it's starting to pickle on me, and, uh, you know, so uh, I, I, never, I never sat around and tried to probe these deep theological questions that a lot of people sit around and try to uh, figure out. I just, I just know this, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, <laughs> and brother, that's all you need to know. And I'm thankful that the Lord said he would take a sinner and save a sinner. A preacher moved into town. He didn't know his way around. He stopped a little boy on the street corner and he said, Son, can you tell me the way to the post office? And the boy said, Yeah, you go down here two blocks, take a left, and you'll see it up there on the right-hand side of the street. The man said, Thank you, son. He said, I'm the new preacher in town. I'd like you to come to my church. And the boy said, What for? He said, Because I want to tell you how to get to heaven. The boy said, Mr., if you don't know how to get to the post office, I don't think you can tell me how to get to heaven. Now, I don't know too much tonight, but I know how to get to heaven. <laughs> and 28 years ago, almost 28 years ago, a man stopped me on the street corner, showed me from the Word of God how that I could have everlasting life, how that I could get to heaven. He showed me in John chapter 14 where Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He showed me that I was a sinner because the Bible said I was a sinner. I knew I was a sinner. He didn't have to do much convincing in that area. And then he showed me that my only hope of eternal life was turning to Jesus Christ 
and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that night on a street corner, I bowed my head, asked Jesus to come into my heart. And brother, let me tell you something, it changed my entire life. Jesus did it all. And I'm thankful tonight. I'm thankful for the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the amazing love of God. I'm thankful for uh, the word of God that lets us know and gives us the assurance that uh, when we trust Jesus Christ, everything is okay. If you would tonight, take your Bibles and just get them ready. <laughs> just keep them handy. <laughs> because we're going to look at a few different verses. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight I'm thankful for each and every person that's come this way. God, I pray now that you would allow me to say the things that need to be said, that you would give me the words, that, Father, you'd clear my mind and help me to uh, speak the word of God tonight in a way that'd be pleasing to you. Father, you know the hearts of men and women, and you know what these people need, and, Father, I do not know. But, Lord, I know this, that your book, your word, is able to feed the hungry soul. And I pray tonight that we would look at the word of God, believe the word of God, be convicted by the word of God. And, Father, may it change our lives even now so that when we leave this place, we will go out with a greater determination to live for you than what we had when we came in. That when we leave this place, we'll be more in love with Jesus than we were when we came in. That when we leave this place, we'll re be rejoicing in what you have done for us. Now, Lord, I pray that if there's anyone in here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that tonight would be the night that they would turn from their sin and turn to you and be saved. And, Father, for those that are saved, Lord, may you use us in these last days. May we have a burden for the lost and dying world around us. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Tonight I want to preach a message out of Luke chapter 16, and we will get over to that passage of Scripture in just a minute. But before we do that, uh, there's a few other verses of Scripture that we're going to look at. You know, when it comes to hell, when it comes to the subject of hell or the doctrine of hell, there's a lot of people that believe that there is no such place. There's a lot of theologians in this world today, a lot of men that claim to be preachers in this world today that do not believe what the Bible says about hell. Now, I do not like to preach on hell. I don't get a great joy out of preaching on hell. But, brother, let me tell you something. Uh, there's a lot in this Bible on the subject of hell, and there's a world out here that's going to hell. And, brother, if you're not going there, it's just by the grace of God. But when you come to the place where you lose your vision of hell, then you will cease to do what God wants you to do. You'll let this dying, uh, lost and dying world just go on on their way without ever trying to uh, stop them, without ever trying to warn them, without ever trying to tell them what is waiting for them at the end of their life. The Bible says a lot about hell. A fellow said one time, if there was more hell preached on Sunday morning, there'd be less hell raised on Saturday night. And you know something? There was a time when you could walk into a church just about any place in this country on a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, and you would hear a preacher get up and preach on hell, but you don't hear about it anymore. You won't turn on the television and hear a message on hell very often. You might once in a great while, but not very often. Billy Graham, for what it's worth, has said that he no longer believes that the fire of hell is a literal fire. He doesn't know what kind of fire it is. Well, brother, I'll tell you what. Jesus said it was a literal fire. He said it's a place where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. He didn't say it was a place where the worm dieth not. <laughs> he said it's a place where their worm dieth not. You know, these Jehovah's Witnesses running around, and they said, well, you know that word there for hell? In the Greek, it's Gehenna, and Gehenna was a dump outside the city of Jerusalem, and outside the city, uh, uh, in that dump, there was always dead things and debris, and there was maggots crawling around there, and there was always a fire burning there, and that's what he, Jesus was talking about. He was talking about that dump, and that's why he said it's a place 
where the worm dieth not. But Jesus didn't say it's a place where the worm dieth not. He said it's a place where their worm dieth not. Brother, let me tell you something. There's a hell tonight. And hell was not made for a man. God never intended man to go to hell. God doesn't want any person in this room to go to hell. God doesn't want anybody in this neighborhood to go to hell. God doesn't want anybody in this world to go to hell. That's why Jesus Christ came into this world and died on the cross, and he shed his blood. He hung on that cross. He took your hell. When Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary, before he ever got to that cross, he went to a garden and prayed and said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And, and he said, Nevertheless, not want my will, but thy will be done. And when Jesus hung on that cross, the cup did not pass. The God poured out the cup of his wrath upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus hung on the cross, somehow he suffered what a man will suffer in eternity if he dies and goes to hell. Jesus suffered man's hell on the cross of Calvary. The wrath of God poured out on Jesus Christ. What's hell? It's a place where the wrath of God is poured out on a man forever and ever. The Bible says some things about hell. In the Old Testament, I'll just read you some verses. In Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 22, it says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundation of the mountains. Brother, the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that hell is right under your feet. It's down in the heart of the earth. And every time one of these volcanoes erupts, it's a testimony of the fact that there's a fire in the heart of this earth. You know where hell is? Some smart aleck comes along and he says, well, where's hell? If there's a hell, where's hell? It's right under your feet. You know, there was a time when we weren't so educated in this country and we were just dumb enough to believe what the Bible says and man believed in hell and believed that it was a fire and believed that it was a place that a person went to to pay for his sin if he didn't trust Jesus Christ. But now we've gotten educated. And we say, well, surely there's no place like that. Surely there is. The Bible says in Job chapter 11 and verse 8, it is as high as heaven. What canst thou do deeper than hell? What canst thou know? Job chapter 26 and verse 6. It says, Hell is naked before him, and destruction hath no covering. In Psalm chapter 9 and verse 17, it says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. You know where this nation's gone tonight? It's gone to hell. You go down to Oktoberfest and watch them wall-to-wall, beard-guzzling a uh, uh, people that care nothing about Jesus Christ outside of using his name for a cuss word. Let me tell you something. This nation is not a Christian nation. This nation is not a godly nation. This nation is not a God-fearing nation. This nation is not a Bible-believing nation. We turned away from God. This nation is on its way to hell said, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. The Bible says in Psalm 18 and verse 5, the sorrows of hell come past me about, the snares of death prevent me. In Psalm 55 and verse 15, it says, let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwelling among them. In Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 11, it says, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more the hearts of the children of men. Over and over and over again, you go through that Bible and you'll find testimony to the fact that there's a hell, that there's a hell. The Bible tells you there is a place called hell. Before you read five chapters in the New Testament, Jesus is talking about hell. In Matthew chapter 5, and this is what is referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. All the modernists and liberals love to go to this, these, these places. You know, the Sermon on the Mount doesn't have anything to do with a saved person in the age of grace. Jesus wasn't telling anybody how to get saved in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. He was telling people what it was going to be like when he sets his kingdom up on this earth. That's what that's all about. But it's so funny how that the, the liberals will flock to Matthew 5, 6, and 7 
and the Beatitudes, but somehow they miss verse 29 and 30. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, this is what the Lord said now, this is what Jesus Christ said. He said, it would be better to lose a member of your body than have your whole body be cast into hell. Look in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18, again, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking. Verse 7, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maim rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Brother, don't you try to tell me that there's not a fire in hell. Don't you try to tell me that it's a fire that is not going to burn forever because the Lord Jesus Christ himself said it's an everlasting fire and he called it hellfire. And he's not talking about the grave. And he's not talking about being consumed in a flame. He's talking about going to the, a place where you will burn forever and ever if you're without Jesus Christ. Take your Bible and turn to Mark. Mark chapter 9. And again, the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching. And he says in Mark chapter 9 and verse 30, 43. Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Jesus wasn't talking about the grave. Every man's going to go to the grave. What good would it be to dismember your body when you're going to go to the grave anyway? It's not the grave. It's a place on the other side of the grave where a man goes to if he has not trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell. Hell. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 14, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. The Bible says that hell hath enlarged itself without measure. You know something? Jesus said broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be that go in there at and this world is on the road on the broad road that leads to destruction. This world is on its way to hell and hell has enlarged herself. The Bible says again in Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 9, Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It has raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And it's talking about the devil going down to hell. Brother, there's a hell. I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to think about it. 
but I'm glad that there was a person one time that told me about it because in my heart I knew that if there really was a hell, that's where I was going to wind up. And if you're in here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're hoping that I'm wrong. But I'm not wrong. You know why I'm not wrong? Because it doesn't have anything to do with what I say. It has to do with what the Bible says and what God says in this book. And God says there's a hell. Jesus said there was a hell. And Jesus preached on hell more than he preached on heaven. Look in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And Jehovah's Witnesses say, well, that's a parable. I wouldn't care if it was a parable. I mean, I've already read you about 15 verses that says there's a hell. If this is a parable, you know why Jesus gave those parables? He gave those parables to illustrate a spiritual truth. Jesus always used something that man could get a hold of, something common, something that man could understand to relate to that man a spiritual truth. And if Luke chapter 16 is a parable, then let me ask you something. What's the spiritual truth behind it? The spiritual truth behind it is there's a place where a man goes to that once he gets there, he's going to wish he wasn't there and he could get out of, but he isn't going to be able to get out of it. That's the spiritual truth behind it. I don't think it's a parable. I believe it's a, 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 an incident that Jesus Christ is talking about. And he says in verse 19, there was a certain rich man, a certain one. He said there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and pull my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember. The first word that that man heard spoken to him when he got to hell, was, son, remember. I'm sure he heard weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Because Jesus said that's what's going to be going on there. Weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. A place where the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. But the first words this man ever heard was, son, remember. You know, memory is a strange thing. It's sort of an elusive thing. We try to remember hymns. We sing these hymns. There's hymns that some of you have sang for 10 and 15 years. You go out there on the street corner without a hymn book, and you won't be able to remember the second verse. But you let some old rock and roll song that you heard way back in the 50s come on, and you'll remember every word of it. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Isn't that strange? I mean, you memorize Bible scriptures, and if you don't keep going through those things and through those things, and through, you'll forget them. But at the most inconvenient times, a joke that you wish that you could forget comes back to your mind. Isn't that wild? That memory is a strange thing. Somebody said that the brain is like a computer. Everything you see and everything you hear is being fed into that uh, brain, that computer, and it's making some kind of impression there. It's being stored in there. And all it takes is for something to trigger it so that it releases and then you remember. 
I don't know too much about the brain. <laughs> I've got a computer. I don't know too much about computers. I just know you push the right buttons, you get the right stuff. You push the wrong buttons, you don't get the right stuff. <laughs> but I know this. There are times in the Bible where the Bible talks about something taking place and all of a sudden somebody remembered what was going on. When you read about Peter in Matthew chapter 26, you know what Peter said there? He said one time to the Lord, he said, Though I'll forsake thee, I'll never forsake thee. And the Lord told him, Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me thrice. And Peter didn't believe that. Peter forgot about that. Peter walked away from the Lord thinking that he wasn't going to deny the Lord. But you know something? When that cock crew, the Bible says that Peter remembered the words of the Lord. And he went out and wept bitter. You know what happened? Something triggered in his brain and he remembered what the Lord had said to him. Here's a man in hell. The first words spoken to this man are, Son, remember. Bingo. Something clicks. Something is triggered. And the man remembers. It says in Luke chapter 16, it says there in verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. According to this verse of scripture here, when a man goes to hell, he's going to be able to remember the good things. Abraham says to Lazarus, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest the good things. You look around you tonight. We're living in a country where people have the good things. We're living in a country that abounds with plenty. People that think they're poor in this country are rich compared to people in other countries. We have it made. We have the good things in this life. We live in the lap of luxury. We have good things to enjoy on a daily basis. We have good times. We have good places that we can go. And brother, this world out here that is lost and outside of Jesus Christ and away from God, they are enjoying the good things. You know, that was a problem back in the Old Testament for Asaph. If you look in Psalm chapter 73, here's a fellow that said, man, I have a problem with this. In Psalm chapter 73 and verse 2, it says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain, violence covereth them as a garment, their eyes stand out with fatness, they have more than the heart could wish. And yet they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression, they speak loftily. Oh, Asaph looked at that and he said, man, he said, I got, he said, I almost went under when I looked around and I saw that the wicked were prospering. And he said, I got envious over the fact that they were prospering like that. Take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 21. Job chapter 21. And look what it says here in Job. Job, Job speaking. Job chapter 21 and verse 7. Wherefore do the wicked live Become old, yea, are mighty in power. Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull gendereth and faileth not. Their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth uh, their little ones like a flock. Their children dance. They take the timber on heart and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. Therefore they say unto God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. 
What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray unto him? Job looked around and he said, I saw the wicked prospering. And you and I can look around this world tonight and we can see people prospering that don't know God and don't care about God. But let me tell you something, when they die outside of Jesus Christ, when they hit hell, there's going to be a time when they will be able to remember the good things that they had in this life and how good God was to them. And you know something? It's the purpose of God that that goodness might bring them to a place of repentance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 2 that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And you know what God wants? God wants a man to realize that the good things he sees and the good things he eats and the good things he enjoys and the, the trees and the sky and the earth and the birds and everything that he enjoys on this earth, all the good things have come from God and it's just a blessing of God that has been put on their life and God wants them to repent and so he pours out his goodness on them. But if they don't repent, you know what's going to happen? In hell, they will remember the good times. They'll remember. When this rich man got to hell, he remembered the good things he enjoyed in this life. Isn't that going to be awful? I mean, hell is going to be bad. The fire. The separation from God. The wailing of the wicked. And now this man is able to remember that when he lived on this earth, he had it made. It was good. Lazarus didn't have it so good. But Lazarus went to the good place, Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died in his sin, went to hell. Not only that, in Luke chapter 16, not only does this man remember the good things, but he also remembers the wrongdoing. It says there in verse 25, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and likewise Lazarus the evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. It says back there in verse 20, but there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate, talking about the rich man's gate, full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. All Lazarus wanted was just a crumb. He just wanted the garbage. He just wanted something that the rich man didn't care about anyway, but he never got that. The only friend he ever had was a dog that came around and licked his sores. But you know something in hell? The rich man remembers his wrongdoing. He remembers Lazarus. And he is told that Lazarus in life received the evil things, and he in life received the good thing. But now Lazarus is comforted and he is tormented. And part of the torment of this man is being able to remember the wrongdoing against Lazarus. You know, I believe a lost man, when he goes to hell, he'll remember his sin against man. Somehow we have the crazy idea that once a man goes to hell, that all of a sudden he's forgiven. All of a sudden, he's regenerated. All of a sudden, now, he doesn't have to do any reaping. But Brother Hell's going to be a place where the, uh, the lost man reaps forever and ever and ever. A hundredfold he's going to reap. He's not reformed when he goes to hell. After burning in hell for a million years, he's still a God-denying, Christ-rejecting, a uh, wicked sinner. He's no better than the day he died. Purgatory idea is nothing but a myth. You don't go there and stay for a million years and get purged of your sins and then get out. Brother, I'll tell you what, throughout eternity, that lost man in hell is still a wicked lost man without God. And yet he'll be able to remember the good things and he'll be able to remember his sin against man. When Ted Bundy died, few years back he was executed 
Ted Bundy was a serial killer. He killed over 20 women. And he said this. He said, I remember everything I ever did in detail. He said that before he died. I remember everything I ever did in detail. You know this boy out here that, that, that killed his family? He'll never forget that. You know, when a man who has gone through this life and he has murdered and plundered and raped and, and, and stolen and lived a wicked life and he dies and goes to hell, if he is outside of Jesus Christ in hell, he'll remember his sin against mankind. He'll remember it. There was a man one time convicted of murdering and raping a young girl. His name was Robert Lee Willie. He was a small, blonde-haired boy. He killed a girl 18 years old, went to the electric chair. When he walked into that room and was strapped into that electric chair, he showed no signs of remorse and no signs of repentance. And they pulled the lever on him, and he never one time said he was sorry to anybody. And I'm not here to judge any man God is the judge. I don't know where that man is as far as whether he is in heaven or in hell, but the indications are he died outside of Jesus Christ and he's in hell. But let me tell you something. He might not show any signs of remorse in this world, but in hell he'll remember his crime and his sin against man. Not only that, man in hell will remember his sin against God. You know what David prayed? He prayed in Psalm 51 and verse 4, Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David realized that his sin in committing adultery with Bathsheba was against God, and he said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. You know, a man in hell, he'll remember his sin against God. God will do something. God will trigger that man's memory, and he will remember his sin against God. It'll haunt him. It'll torment him. That Bible says that he is in torment in verse 23. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes being in torments. One of the things that will torment that man in hell is that memory of his sin against man, his sin against God. Not only that, he'll remember that there's no way out of the place that he's in. In verse 26, it says, And beside all this, between you, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from sin. This man was told that there is a gulf fixed. The people over here on the paradise side, over here in Abraham's bosom, they could not go over to the hell part, and the people in hell couldn't get over there to the paradise part because there was a great gulf fixed. Now listen, when Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he led captivity captive, he took those people out of that side, that paradise side, and now it's up in heaven. But when Jesus was on this earth before his crucifixion, it was down there in the heart of the earth, and a man died, and he went to paradise. If he had been forgiven of his sins, he wasn't cleared yet. He got forgiveness by doing what the law told him to do, but he didn't get cleared until the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. And after Jesus went up there and presented himself to the Father, he came back down and led captivity captive. <laughs> Brother, I'll tell you what. That man in hell, he's going to remember when he gets there that there's no way out. He's down there. He's, he's lost. He was lost in this world. He's still lost in hell. You know, lost is a horrible word. Lost means you're without direction. Lost means that you are wandering around. You have no idea. You are disoriented. You are confused. You don't know where you are when you're lost. A person gets lost at sea. 
They don't know where they are. They don't know which way land is. They're lost. They don't have a compass to guide them or fix them on a heading. If they don't have uh, some kind of an instrument where they can uh, take a heading off of a star and chart a course, they just drift out there round and around and around until they succumb to the elements and die. They're lost. A man goes out in the wilderness. He gets out there in the woods. He's lost out there in the woods. He's wandering around, no direction. He can't tell which way is out, where civilization is. If he's lost, he's without guidance. He's without direction. He's disoriented. And the Bible says that a man in this world without Jesus Christ is lost. He's lost. No direction. He's wandering around. He's hopeless. He's without God. He's lost in this world. And when he dies and goes to hell, he's lost there. But God will cause him to remember that there is no way out. He's there forever. The truth will rush upon him. The truth of his sinful condition. The truth of how wicked he really is. Man tries to justify himself. Man tries to look at another man and say, well, at least I, you know, I, I go down here to Eddieville. Norm was here last night, and, and Norm and Steve and, and myself and some fellows from the church, every now and then we go down there to Eddieville, and you know those people down there, those guys that are, that are in prison and some of them in, in Eddieville for the rest of their lives, you know what they, that they, they themselves will justify themselves. A killer will look at a child molester and say, I might have killed somebody, but I never did some dirty thing like that. Isn't that strange? Isn't that strange how man justifies himself? But listen, a person in hell, the truth will dawn upon him, and he will realize how wicked he really is. And he'll realize he's lost forever. The truth of his eternal damnation will settle in among him. The truth of his missed opportunity. The fact that he could have been saved. I don't know whether there's anybody in here tonight that's without Jesus Christ or, or not. I don't know. But let me say this. If you walk out of this building tonight lost, and you die in that condition, do you know what you'll remember? You'll remember a night in September when you came up to a little church on the side of a hill on Taylor Mill Road and heard a preacher get up and turn red in the face and scream at you and warn you about the damnation of hell and plead with you not to go there. And if you go there, you will realize that you miss your opportunity. Don't go out lost. Trust Jesus Christ. Get saved before you leave. A man in hell, he'll also remember this. He'll remember that others are coming. Look in verse 27. After Abraham said, son, remember. In verse 27, the rich man said, then he said, I pray thee, therefore, father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. That rich man realized that his five brethren were following in his steps, and they were going to wind up in the same place he was. You know something? A lost man will remember that others are coming. This man had more of a burden for people that were on this earth coming after him than a lot of us have that know the truth. Loved ones that are lost and on their way to hell. He has accepted his doom. He has accepted the fact that there is no way out for him, so he now says, Send someone to my brothers. You might have loved ones on their way to hell tonight. That's a horrible thought. That's a terrifying thing to think about. I was on the street corner in Dayton with a man. 
who I did not know very well, and as a matter of fact, tonight I cannot even remember his name. We went up there and did some street preaching and passed out tracts. And this man just sort of had a knack, a way about him, able to stop people and talk to them. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to learn this man's technique. I'm going to find out what he has. I'm out there, like some of you guys, you know, trying to do everything in my power to get somebody to stop their wisdom by me, but he's just standing there and people are stopping, talking to him. And so I ease up there beside him, you know, while he's talking to somebody. I just keep on passing out tracks and sort of shuffling towards him, you know, where I can get into earshot so I can hear him. And I looked at him and I saw tears coming down out of his eyes. And here's what I heard him say. My father died without Jesus Christ and he's in hell. There was a man who had a burden because he had a loved one that was in hell and he knew that loved one would never get out. He didn't try to say, there is no hell. He didn't try to say, oh, I hope that, I hope that the Bible's wrong. I hope there isn't a place. He said, there is a hell and my dad messed up. Maybe his mom messed up. Maybe his brother messed up. I don't know. But he had some loved ones that were in hell. And so he went out there on the street and he stopped people. And he said, I can't do anything for them. But maybe I can help you. Please don't go to hell. A man in hell. He'll remember that loved ones and friends are on the way. Hell's an awful place. Hell's a place of torment. Hell's a place there's no getting out of. Hell's a place where once a man goes there, he will wish others would be warned so they won't go there. Look in verse 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. When a man goes to hell, he'll remember the scripture. After Abraham said this, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The conversation has ended. This man had heard Moses and the prophets. This man knew what Abraham was telling him was true. And there's no more conversation when he's reminded of the scriptures. The Old Testament, those verses I read you, testify of hell. The New Testament testifies of hell. Jesus preached on it over and over again. When you get to the last book, the book of Revelation, it testifies of hell. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about the white throne judgment, and it says, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And every man was judged according to his work. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. A man in hell will remember the scriptures. A man in hell will remember the scriptures he heard about hell. A man in hell will remember the scriptures that testified to him that Jesus Christ was the way out of hell. A man in hell will remember the convicting power of God because, see, Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes into the world, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And Jesus, uh, the, the Holy Spirit, has been doing his work, is doing his work tonight, and will continue to do his work right on through to the end. And man is convicted of the fact that there is a hell and there is judgment coming, and a lost man knows in his heart that if there is a hell, he He'll wind up there. He just wants to try to believe there isn't one. And yet, the Old Testament testifies of it. The New Testament testifies of it. The uh, apostles testified of it. Jesus warned and testified of it. There's a hell. Nature testifies of it. You think about those fires burning out there in the West. You think about getting trapped in one of those fires. You think about people 
in houses that are that are burnt to death. You know, that, that's something that, that, that is horrifying. You don't like to think about it. You don't like to, to hear about it. Nature testifies that there's a hell. Science. I don't, I, you know, when it comes to science, as far as I'm concerned, science is a joke. But, you know, science is forced to testify the fact that there's a hell. I read an article about some fellas and they were over in Russia someplace, or I, I forget exactly where they were. I think they were over in Russia. And they were drilling down into the earth, and they picked up this high-pitched sound, some kind of a squealing sound. They thought, they saw, thought something down there on their, uh, the, the tip of their drill was messed up, and so they, they stopped the drilling, and they listened on that hole, and they could hear, still hear this, this sound. And they couldn't understand what it was. So they got some amplification equipment of some kind and they were able to lower it down into the hole that they drilled. And this is what they said. I don't know whether it's true or not. They said it was people screaming. I don't know whether what they heard was screaming or not, but I know this, hell's in the heart of the earth and I know in hell there are people screaming tonight. And they are begging, and they are wishing they had another chance. The scriptures testify of the fact that there is a hell. This man remembered. Now there's some things that you and I should remember tonight before we leave. Let's remember this. Let's remember when you trusted Jesus. Can you remember that? Can you remember when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm not asking you to remember a feeling. I'm not asking you to remember an experience. I'm not asking you to remember an emotional reaction. I'm asking you to remember a time when you realized you were a sinner. You could not save yourself. There was no hope for you. And Jesus was your only way to stay out of hell. And you turned to him and trusted him. I'm asking you to remember that. If you can't remember that, if you can't remember trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you're in trouble tonight. You better remember that. You better come to the place where you're able to remember that. Brother, I'll tell you what. I can remember. You say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I was just a child. But do you remember? You say, I can't remember everything that was involved in it. I'm asking you, can you remember trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior? If you can't, that's what you need to do. That's what you need uh, be, before you can uh, have the assurance that you're not going to die in your sins and go to hell. You have to remember that there was a time when you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm not asking you to remember how you prayed. Because you know something? I don't believe a prayer saves a person. I've heard people come down to the altar and they said, Lord, I know I'm no good. And forgive me of this and forgive me of that. The Bible says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's not a prayer that you say that saves your soul. It's a heart condition when in your heart you realize you're lost and Jesus is your only way of salvation and you trust in him with your heart Then he saves your soul and the prayer is going to come as a result of what's taking place in your heart. Can you remember when you trusted Jesus? Can you remember that there was a change that took place in your life? You see, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And there is, there is a, a, a stigma as far as Christianity is concerned. We, we try to tell a person, just believe on Jesus Christ and everything's going to be okay. But brother, I'll tell you what, that head belief doesn't make a change in the life. But a heart belief changes the man every time. Because the Word of God, the power of the Word of God takes effect on that individual's life. Can you remember? Can you remember when you were transformed into a new creature in Christ Jesus? Can you remember the work of the Holy Spirit in your life? Can you remember that the Word had a powerful effect on you? Can you remember that when you got saved, you desired everybody to be saved? Can you remember that there was a time that you didn't care nothing about the Bible and you didn't care nothing about prayer and you didn't care nothing about Christians and you didn't care anything about church, but Jesus came in and now you want church and you want the Bible and you want prayer and maybe the flesh gets the better of you sometime and you don't get all that you should get, but there is a desire there because there was a time Jesus changed your life. Can you remember? Can you remember that after you got saved, there was a desire to do something for the Lord? I think that's, I think that's just as natural as a baby wanting milk. For a person to get saved and then want to do something for the Lord. I can't imagine a person getting saved and knowing they're going to miss hell and knowing their sins have been forgiven and knowing Jesus is going to prepare a place for them in heaven and knowing that he promised to come back and get them and knowing that he's going to give them a glorified body and then not want to do anything for the Lord Jesus Christ. Something wrong with that. Can you remember the desire to serve the Lord and see others get saved? Live for God and do something for Jesus Christ to please him? Do you remember the ones that cared about you? The ones that didn't give up on you? The ones that kept coming after you when you were lost? Maybe it was a praying mama. Maybe it was a concerned friend. Maybe it was a, a, a fired up Christian. But someone got concerned about your soul and they came and besought you in the name of Jesus Christ to turn from your sin and get saved. Do you remember that? There's some things that we need to remember on this side of the grave. And if you can't remember those things, you die without Jesus Christ, you'll remember all the other things. Are you saved tonight? You say, yes, Brother McDowell, I'm saved. There's a hell. It's not for you. It's not for me. But it might be for one of your loved ones if they don't get saved. It might be for one of your friends if they don't get saved. It might be for one of your children if they don't get saved, it might be for someone that you wish that you could do something for if, 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 if they don't get saved. Paul said that his heart's desire uh, for Israel, that they all might be saved. Paul was willing uh, to, to change places. Paul was willing to be condemned so that Israel could be saved. He had a burden. You're saved. You don't have to worry about going to hell. But there's somebody else that you know that's lost. And they're gone now. Will you remember them? Let's stand for a word of prayer. Let's just bow our heads for a moment and close our eyes. And we're going to pray here in just a second. You're in here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. I can think of no better time than right now 
to trust Jesus. Today's the day of salvation. There's no reason why you can't get saved tonight. Not one reason why you can't get saved tonight. Not one. If you're in here and you're lost, and you go out of here lost, the only reason you'll do that is because you don't want Jesus Christ. You don't want to go to heaven. You want to keep taking a chance and gambling with your soul. Won't you turn to Jesus Christ tonight? Before we pray, before we have an invitation hymn, let me ask you something. Is there anyone in here tonight that would be willing to raise their hand and say, Brother McDowell, remember me in prayer. I know I'm lost. If I died right now, I'd go to hell. I know that the message was directed to me, and I'm concerned about my soul. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand, just stick it up in the air, and put it back down again? Anyone at all? I'd like to pray for you. I'll not embarrass you. I'll not put you on the spot. I'll just pray for you. Is there anyone like that, young or old, that would be willing to raise their hand and say, I'm not saved. If I died tonight, I'd go to hell. Pray for me. Anyone at all. Our Heavenly Father, you know the hearts of these people. And Lord, while there have no hands been raised, you know the heart. God, if there is someone here that could not raise their hand or would not raise their hand, Father, won't you convict them? Won't you help them to see that they need to be saved tonight? Lord, I pray that you'd deal with them. I pray that you'd make them uneasy. I pray that you would make them miserable until they turn from their sin and trust Jesus Christ. God, I pray for the saved people in here tonight. Remind us, Lord, what you've done for us. God, help us to see what you delivered us from. Help us to be thankful and indebted to you to the place where we want to tell others and try to reach others for you. God, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts now. And Lord, please, don't let somebody go out of this place lost in their sin tonight. May they turn to Jesus and be saved. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I'm going to ask our song leader to come up tonight, if he would. We'll have an invitation hymn here. Perhaps everyone in this building tonight is saved. You are? That's wonderful. Maybe there's someone you know that's lost. Maybe you need to pray for them. And if you need to do that while we sing this invitation hymn, you feel free to come. But if you are in here tonight and you're lost and you'd like to be saved, you'd like to get it settled tonight and do something about it tonight, I can guarantee you on the authority of this book right here, if you'll turn to Jesus Christ and come to him, he'll not turn you away. The Bible says, All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I shall in no wise cast out. God's invitation has come. Come, let us reason together. Saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God's invitation in the book of Revelation is come. The spirit and the bride say come. Let him that heareth say come. Take of the water of life freely. God's invitation is come. Will you come to Jesus Christ and get saved tonight? What page will we say? Page 305. Page 305, almost persuaded. If you need to come tonight and pray, pray for someone else. You do what God wants you to do as we sing this song.
before we sing another verse and while people are praying here, the night I got saved, November the 8th, 1966, standing in front of the YMCA in Mobile, Alabama, I was conscious of only three things. I was conscious of, number one, a man asking me if I wanted to be saved. I was conscious of a presence there that I now know to be the Holy Spirit of God that was saying to me, you know that it's so, you know that it's true, you need to do something about it, do it tonight. Another presence there saying, this guy's a nut. You've got things planned. What about the plans you have for your life? Get away from it. Go down the street. And I was being pulled. The devil was pulling me one way, and God was saying, come to my son Jesus Christ. And that night I bowed my head. I wasn't conscious of cars, people, or anything else. I was conscious of the fact that if I died right then, I would go to hell, and I didn't want to go to hell. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart, and he changed everything that night. He changed it. What about you? If you're in here and you're lost, the same thing is happening to you tonight. The Holy Spirit's saying, come. I'm saying, come. The devil's saying, hold out. It'll be over in a few minutes. What are you going to do? Let's sing a couple more verses. If you need to get saved tonight, if you need to come tonight, you come as we sing. says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Friend, uh, we, don't, we don't say that tonight to scare nobody. I sit over here and I prayed and, and I realized that the most three, in a, in a fleshly sense, the three most important men of my life that are alive today are lost, dying, and going to hell. I realized that my brother is lost, going to hell. I realized my dad's lost and going to hell. I realize my Uncle Ron is lost and going to hell. And I guess in a fleshly sense, in a carnal sense, those are the three most important men of my life. Lost, dying on the way to hell. You know, if you're here and you're lost, you've had people praying for you and weeping for you. And if you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, one of these times is going to be the last time. One of these days is going to be the last message you heard preached. The last invitation you heard give. And the next time it's going to be out of darkness. It's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth. I pray. We're going to sing one more song. I pray if you don't resist. If you're not saved, you come up here, and I'll show you through the Bible how to be saved. Say it takes some guts. Take one step. Watch God pack you on up here in a minute. Don't take no guts. Don't take no guts. Trust Jesus Christ your Savior. The greatest thing you ever do in your life. What number, brother? The next one, 306. Just as I am. He took me just as I was, <laughs> and that was an accomplishment. He'll take the rest of you. Just as you are, he'll take you if you come.
All right, we're going to sing verse number five, and it'll be the last verse we sing, sing tonight. You reject Jesus Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. I'm not going to sit up here and beg and plead with you. We're all grown up. We're all adults. It's an individual thing, brother. If you want to die and go to hell, sad as I, I hate to say it, God will put you there. We're going to sing one more verse of one more song, and we're close. Personal thing, folks, between you and Jesus Christ. We can't do it for you, or we would. Sing this verse, and we're going to close if you don't come. tonight and you've heard the truth tonight and I pray if you're not saved that you won't leave this building without grabbing somebody, just whoever it is. You know, if you're a lady, grab a lady. They'll show you through the Bible, they'll get somebody to you. We don't want you to take our word, take the Bible. If not, the Bible says, whosoever is called the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wherever it is. I'm sure if we took a ransom poll of uh, where people were saved and when, I'm sure we'll get some wild things. I know me, I was saved on a Friday night at Tom. I know I look back there at Leroy. I let him the Lord at times. On Friday, I don't know what day it was. I let him the Lord at times. There's been some strange places people got saved. You can get saved tonight in your bedroom, on your couch, and you're calling away to home. You just got to realize you're a sinner headed for hell. And you got to realize you don't want to go there. And you got to realize Jesus Christ, when he said it is finished, he did it all, it's finished. But you got to ask him and trust him as your Savior. Father, I thank you tonight, God, for these people. Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that this message, Lord, on hell, God, I know it's not preached on enough. God, and I know it's not real to us as it should be, God, or, or we would uh, be out here and warning the wicked, God. And Father, I know that tonight, that if you would come back, God, that a lot of us Christians would have bloody hands. Father, I pray, God, tonight that, that we would uh, get on the ball and, and Lord, and get the blood of uh, some of our friends and some of our family and the blood of this neighborhood, and God, and the blood of the people we work with off our hands, God, and put them on their head. Lord, I pray, God, that you would help us to stand for you, God, and witness to you, Lord, and not, not give up, God, and not quit dog knocking on doors, and not quit passing out tracks, God, and not quit going in the city, Lord, and crying aloud. Father, I pray, God, you'd help us to keep doing that. Lord, I pray tonight, God, for, Lord, for my brother and for my dad, Lord, and for my uncle. Lord, I pray, God, that somehow you'd deal with their hearts, Father, that they would not die and go to hell. Lord, uh, I thank you, Lord, that what you've done for me, God. And I pray if there's somebody here that's not lost, Father, I pray that they would have trouble tonight sleeping, God, with this message on their heart. Lord, I pray that you would bring these words that this man preached to him, Lord, tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bring, God, that as it appointed on a man wants to die and after this, the judgment. Father, I know, God, that when it's over, we're going to face you, Lord. And it's not going to be uh, Hail Mary, Father. It's not going to be somebody throwing money at the priest to get us on the glory. Father, it's going to be what we've done with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray tonight, God, you deal with each and every heart in here, God, no matter who it is. Lord, if there's somebody here that everybody in this building might think they're saved, God, but in their heart, they don't know. Father, in their heart, they know they're lost. I pray, God, that no matter who it is, that they would grab me or any other brother in this church, Father, and, and ask them and say, I'm not sure. Will you show me through the Bible how to be saved? Father, I thank you for tonight, God, and I pray that you would bring us up all back again in the morning, Father, to, to study your word, Lord, and to hear the preaching of your word. God, it's the word, God, that you live, Lord, and it's the word, God, that you've left and preserved here, Lord. And Father, and I thank you for the book, God, and I thank you for a Savior that shed his blood for a wretch like me. Father, I pray you deal with the hearts of people here tonight, God, members of this church and people that are members of other churches, God, that they would hold the fort. Father, you've left us a perfect book. And you gave us a perfect salvation. Father, we don't have to do nothing to accept it. Lord, and I pray, God, that you'd help us to live for you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for coming.